43rd President of the United States, George W. Bush. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Laura and I are thrilled you're here. And we're thrilled we're here. <laughs> uh, because it's going to be a, a not, I wouldn't call it entertaining, I'd say informative evening. Uh, I want to thank Next Point for endowing our Engage series. Uh, it's our way of contributing to the knowledge of our community. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's been unbelievably successful. Uh, one of the things we're good at is convincing people to come and share their knowledge here at the Bush Center, and uh, that's what's happening tonight. Uh, the, uh, the topic is how the intelligence community protects our country, which is like really important. <laughs> Uh, Linda Weisgold and her husband Paul is with us. Uh, I first met Linda, uh, she was the CIA briefer, which means every morning other than Sunday, she would come into my office and bring me the intelligence from the community. And uh, she was really good, very smart woman. I, I learned best through the Socratic method. In other words, I peppered her with questions <laughs> every morning and she handled them unbelievably well. Now, she's now the deputy director of uh, analysis at the CIA. Uh, in other words, she's like one of the top three in the agency. And we're very fortunate that she has taken time to come and share her wisdom and knowledge. Uh, Stephen Hadley, now today happens to be his 76th birthday, by the way. Um, Steve, you don't look a day over 75. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, he was in my administration for eight years. Uh, he was a uh, national security advisor for four. In other words, he also was in my office on a daily basis, uh, briefing me on events of the world. He ran a huge staff of very knowledgeable people whose job it was to keep the president informed and to help uh, make decisions. Uh, one of the things that Steve has done is he has produced a very unique book called Handoff. He and he's told me 60 people that worked in my administration have gathered memos that we prepared for the Obama administration transition. Uh, it's a way for future historians to analyze the decisions we made. In other words, here's what we inherited and here's where we ended up. Uh, the, the memos are not judgmental in the sense that Bush was always right, but they are factual. <laughs> And uh, I, I can't tell you how important this is going to be for the ability for people, historians and scholars, to analyze what went on for, uh, you know, eight pretty tumultuous years. Uh, and finally, Kyle Bass, who's a local entrepreneur, very successful business guy, he runs Heyman Capital, will be the moderator. And so please welcome Linda, Steve, and Kyle to our stage. Thank you, Mr. President and uh, Mrs. President. Uh, it's an honor uh, to be up here with, uh, with such esteemed uh, company here. I want to thank the Bush Institute, President and Mrs. Bush, Jim Dondero, Ken Hirsch, uh, for putting this all together. And uh, tonight, I think we have, uh, we have so much to talk about in so little time. So uh, if we would, if you don't mind, let's start off with uh, the topic of Mr. Hadley's book. You know, how important is the intelligence community to the transitions uh, presidents, uh, in this case from President Bush to President Obama? What, what can the intelligence community do to, to level that playing field and, and keep that continuity moving forward from one administration to the other? We'll, we'll start, we want to start sure. with, uh, with you, Linda. Um, well, first off, thank you so much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. So presidential transitions, actually the way you phrased it I think is, is exactly right. It's that leveling the playing field. Um, so it was, I believe it was President Truman who started the process of actually having the intelligence community start to brief um, presidential candidates as soon as they were um, elected, so president-elects. And the idea behind this was that he did not want anyone to go through what he had gone through 
um, at the end of FDR's uh, term when he felt that he took over not as prepared as he wanted to be. And that tradition continues. So the intelligence community actually, when we're talking about uh, presidents, um, we start, we do one briefing uh, for all presidential candidates before the big debate. Um, once there is a president elect, we start showing, uh, with the permission of the current president, uh, that individual, the briefings that we prepare for the president. Um, so when they start seeing the, the very first, uh, the same material. Um, a quick funny story, when uh, that happened with President Bush, we actually were showing him the same book um, that his predecessor was getting, and about, I don't know, maybe three quarters of the way through before he took office, uh, the then briefer turned to him and said, well, sir, so you know, how, how do you like the book right now? And for us, the big deal at that point had been things like in the past, people would be, oh, I'd prefer the binding on the side or the top. Or, and he looked at it and he said to us, I can't wait to start getting the good stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a bit of a crisis, an uh, identity crisis for us. Um, we, we sat down though and we talked about what that really meant. And I will say that it, it changed in many ways the way we started to deliver intelligence to presidents and continues today. It was more about not just what we thought was happening in the world, but also what was already being done about it. Um, and that was, that was something different for us. Um, so that is from the presidential transition, how we do it. We do the same um, for uh, those working in the administration. We also do the same for Congress. Uh, we present kind of that what's been happening while you were out of office, while you were, uh, and it's a little bit different than, than what they've been reading in the, uh, the press. Uh, I would just add a couple of things to what Linda said. One is this type, type uh, sort of what is the role of the intelligence community in terms of protecting our democracy? I think you have to recognize it's the first line of defense. Mm -hmm. It's the first line of defense. There are a lot of threats to this country from other nation states, from terrorist groups, from organized crime, and they are the, the, the folks who are, identify the problem and they go beyond that, and they will also provide intelligence input to policymakers as to how do you craft the response or the options for responding to the problem they've identified. They really are the first line of defense of this country, and they treat the president as the principal consumer, not the only consumer, but the principal consumer because of the president's role as commander in chief. And so they really take this transition very seriously and they view it as their job to make sure that the new president is fully prepared in terms of understanding the world and the challenges we face before they step into the Oval Office. It's an awesome responsibility. And President Bush, at least, cared very deeply about how that process was done. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make sure that the right briefings went to the pre incoming president, and there were some things, quite frankly, he wanted to brief the incoming president about himself, because they were so important. Uh, there's an issue, there are all kinds of very interesting that come, issues that come up. One of the things is the new president says, well, I wanna share, I wanna have 10 people sit in when I get my president's daily brief. And uh, the president had a view that if, you know, he did, he's delighted to have the president brief, but 10 people who may or may not end up in the incoming administration, that's probably not right. So there is an issue of the intelligence community and the outgoing president has to wrestle with, which is how do you support the new president, but also how to do it in a way that keeps the nation's secrets. For a new president who hasn't been through it, probably doesn't know what all of that that it takes. So it's an interesting dance mm -hmm. between the outgoing president and the incoming president. And what made it work, and I think generally makes it work, is if you have presidents like President Bush and President Obama who are committed personally to a good transition and to preparing the incoming president and his team to deal with the issues, that was critical uh, in order to have a good transition. And we were lucky to have that in both President Bush and President Obama. Um, uh on another, on another note, as we think about different presidents doing different things, I think, it's, I think we all know that President Bush um, either never missed a briefing or rarely, if ever, missed one. How do you in the intelligence community think about some presidents that care a lot about it, others that might not, or some others might not even understand what's happening? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess what I would say is that um, how every president takes in information is different. 
um, you know, some are readers, some, um, as, as President Bush said today, uh, like the Socratic method, want to be able to talk about it with people. Um, I tend to look at this that there are two ways in which, uh, and I've now worked for seven presidents, um, that there are two ways in which I measure our success. Um, and that is, uh, do they make time for intelligence? And that is whether it's an actual briefing or reading the book or whatever. And the other is, do they ask questions? Because if they don't care what we think, they don't have to ask. Yeah. Um, and I will say that in all seven, for all seven presidents, regardless of what you may have heard in the news, both of those happened um, in all administrations I've worked for. Great. So we're gonna try to cover tonight Ukraine, Russia, terrorism, Turkey, and, and China um, in a, <laughs> as quick as we can. Like, um, like speed dating. I think it's be exactly, <laughs> speed talking. So you guys need to speed up your, okay. your response. Let's, let's just talk real quickly, if we can, about the early intelligence assessments on, on Russia, Ukraine. You know, we got just about almost everything right as we analyzed Russia. We almost missed everything in the response, the Ukrainian response to Russia's aggression. You know, what were our early, what were our early assessments and, uh, and where are we right now? And I'll just jump to the punchline. How did both of you think this is going to play out? Um, okay, so I'm going to do what I, I do as a briefer. Um, what's key to CIA's kind of ethos is I'm gonna speak truth to power. I'm gonna say, I don't think you have it right. Um, so uh, I would say that we, uh, we actually, um, on Russia, yes, we were able to provide advance warning to do what we in the intelligence community want to do, which is to give our, uh, give our policymakers decision advantage. Um, and we did that through both, you know, I'm not gonna reveal sources and methods, but also through the expertise that we had. On Ukraine, I would say, I wouldn't believe everything you've heard in the press. Um, I think what we actually told our policymakers on Ukraine is a little different than how it's been uh, described. But I will say, I think that the next six months are really important um, in what's going to go, uh, what's gonna happen in Russia, Ukraine. Um, and it is as important um, how the West reacts um, and what's going on. So as, Ru as winter you know, eases in Ukraine, I think we will see the Russians try and make um, a new push. Uh, but Western resolve, how much weapons we give them, the kind of intelligence we continue to share, all of that is going to, to really play, make a difference. And I think it's gonna be crucial um, for the out outcome of the war. I agree with Linda. I'm worried about this. I think we've all sort of gotten a little bit, and David Kramer here, and he may edit my remarks after the fact, but I think we all got a little carried away by the remarkable success of the Ukrainians, the courage they showed, the fantastic leadership, the President Zelensky. Uh, you can't say enough about that. It's been really remarkable. But I worry about them uh, because the Russians have mass. They have the manpower and they have the industrial base, and the Ukrainians don't. And I, what I think we are seeing now is a, is a race, in some sense, two clocks. There's a Russian clock, and what they are trying to do is move these new recruits, 300,000 in a special mobilization, another 120,000 in terms of conscript, cons, annual conscription, and probably more. They're trying to rush them through training, get them to the front, to try to overwhelm the Ukrainians en masse. That's the Russians clock, and it's moving pretty quickly. Ukrainian clock is they're trying to get this equipment, which we're, quite frankly, we are late in getting them, uh, late getting the decisions, late getting them trained, trying to get this equipment in place so it would be available, ta tanks, armored personnel carriers, car carriers and the rest, so it will be available to try to blunt the Russian offensive and maybe do a counteroffensive. The problem is that the Ukrainian clock is late. And the other clock that Putin is counting on is that at some point we will tire. The United States, our politics will overwhelm this issue, the Allies will have other concerns, and people will grow tired of supporting Ukraine. So two clocks. And my worry is that the, the, that the Russians are keeping up on their timetable and we're not allowing the Ukrainians adequately to meet it. Mm. Uh, I think the critical, the next, as Linda says, the next year is gonna be critical. If the Russians succeed and do a breakthrough, that's one set of uh, outcomes. If the Ukrainians are able to accelerate the uh, bringing the arms to the front, 
and actually, for example, were able to cut through Zaporizhia and threaten the landline between Russia and, uh, and the Crimea. Uh, there is a good chance that Putin at that point, feeling that he's at strategic risk, might sort of be willing to enter into some kind of negotiation that isn't capitulation by Ukraine. If you do negotiations now, it's capitulation by Ukraine, which is why Zelensky has said no. So I think the next year is gonna tell the tale, and I think our policy ought to be to accelerate the training and equipping of the Ukrainians because they are willing to do the fighting mm -hmm. to stop the Russians. And finally, it is important that Putin be stopped. He has a view about reconstituting the Russian Empire that starts with Ukraine and absorbing Ukraine, but doesn't end there. Mm -hmm. And if we don't want to have this battle you know, taken north in the Baltic states where it becomes NATO versus Russia, we better stop Putin strategically now in Ukraine. Oh, thank you. I one could argue there's a third clock, right? How long can the Ukrainians go without power and water? You know, um, that's another while, while their country's being turned into a parking lot. Right. You know, I, I think I, I don't think our country could go a year with 70 percent of our grid down and, and no drinking water. I, I agree. I think um, one of the things, though, that is really important to remember and again, getting back to that idea about Ukraine and its capabilities, um, they've been fighting for a long time. Right. Mm -hmm. This didn't just start. And so, yes, while the civilian uh, casualties are high, the you know, um, hits against the infrastructure in Ukraine is, is, are tremendous, um, the, the will uh, to fight it is there. When I go back and think about Crimea and think about Sevastopol and what they did in 2014, why weren't we more, why weren't we more punitive on our response in 2014? What did we miss back then? Because um, <clears throat> as I talked to endowments and pensions, Around the country, around the country, um, in 2017, they were all investing in Russia like it was a great place. Everything was cheap. Wall Street couldn't help itself because Russian companies were cheap. What did we miss in 2014? Um, I guess what I would say it's different this time. 2014 happened uh, incredibly quickly. Right, the the Russians already had uh, troops um, right there. Um, you know, they had bases. Um, and their ability to actually, you know, take over Crimea happened incredibly quickly. I would say that there were actions. Um, there were sanctions that were taken. There were sanctions against Putin's own kind of private bank, if you will, his own bank. Um, but, but you're right, it, it wasn't the same. I would also say at that point, a lot of um, folks living in Crimea were more supportive of Russia. Um, so the international community's response was, you're right, it was different. Um, but it was a different action. Um, it happened very quickly. There were you know, very few casualties. Um, so. I think this is not an issue to lay up to the intelligence community. I think it's a policy issue. Exactly. And you know, when, uh, as President Bush will remember, when Putin went into Georgia in 2008, one of the things that we said very clearly, and he said very clearly, was if we don't impose strategic costs on Putin for going into Georgia. Today it'll be Georgia, and we, this was very explicit. Today will be Georgia, tomorrow it will be Ukraine, and the day after it'll be the Baltic states, yeah. and that is uh, a, a NATO-Russia war. So we better discourage Putin from re, re, rehearsing this and rerunning it after Georgia. So at the president's direction, we had spent seven and a half years putting all kinds of relations between the United States and Russia at all levels in our government, trying to br establish a cooperative relationship, bring them into the Western uh, international system. Uh, and at the end, basically, the President put all those on the deep freeze and stopped them all to try to make the point to Putin that he was going to risk his relationship with the West over Georgia and he better not do it again. And I think, unfortunately, that was not carried through as aggressively as it might have been. We had the reset of relations between Russia and the United States, and it had an impact. And I'll give you this anecdote. On the day that Putin decided to go into Ukraine this time, he'd been in there in 2014, to do it, go again in 2022, I was on a video with a Russian counterpart on one of these track twos between non-governmental people on the US side, non-governmental people on the Russian side. And a person I know well on the Russian side said, you know, when we went into Georgia, everybody said it was gonna destroy relations, relations with the West. But after a few months, you know, we resumed relations were just the way they were before. That's what's gonna happen now. 
if Putin goes into Ukraine. That's, I think, a lesson about how you've got to deter early mm -hmm. and firmly if you're going to change someone's mindset. And I think the other thing that happened is Putin increasingly became taken with this notion of a new Russian empire. And that's what I think we did not anticipate in 2008 and 2014, and that's what we're seeing now. I would just add one other thing. I think that um, intelligence this time, um, were, we were more aggressive in uh, declassifying or sharing information with our NATO partners um, than we had on some other occasions. And I really think that, again, one of the roles of intelligence um, in this conflict has been to help create uh, a sense of a coalition, um, to have an informed NATO that is willing and, and understood uh, what Putin was up to, knew that he was coming, what his motives were, all of those. So I think that's been um, another part of what the intelligence community has done. And I want to say one thing. While I was critical of the administration for not moving equipment and training into Ukraine promptly enough, I think you have to give them very good high marks on their use of intelligence, <clears throat> declassifying intelligence, and using it to let the Ukrainians and our allies know what was coming. I think that's been a strong point. And then using that process to build a coalition between the United States and Europe to support the Ukrainians. I give them high marks for that. When you talk about uh, <coughs> briefing you know, allies, you know, the, the gorilla in the room there is Turkey. Do we, do we brief different allies different ways, or do we give it all to NATO at the same time? <coughs> how, how do we really think about Erdogan and, and what, what's really going on in Turkey? Um, so briefings for NATO take place at the North Atlantic Council, and Turkey is a member of NATO. Um, so, so they are there, um, and they, they hear the same briefings. Um, but again, you know, we have different relationships with different countries, and we might share more with some than others. Um, but uh, as a member of NATO, Turkey's getting the same briefings as everybody else. Got it. Well, it, maybe you want to talk about this, maybe you don't, uh, but I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I think in the end, when, when we all game theory what's going on in Russia and Ukraine, we all know Putin's a strong man, and he's not going home a loser. We all know Zelensky and the Ukrainians and even the West say, we're not going to cede one ounce of land or else it's going to uh, encourage that specific behavior again. I, I don't see an off-ramp. You know, talk me down uh, from understanding when Putin's going to use a tactical nuke or do something really unchained. Well, Putin uh, actually burnt his own exit ramp, if you will, mm -hmm. probably mixed meta metaphors, when he declared that the four provinces in eastern Ukraine were now part of Russia, even though he didn't control all the territory in those provinces. And he made very clear that that has to be the starting point of any negotiation. Mm. Well, that's to put out a position that makes is on its face, unacceptable to Zelensky and the Ukrainian people, and the Ukrainian people don't support that. Zelensky, for his part, came back with his opening position is, Russia has to leave all of Ukrainian territory, pay reparations, and they need to be held accountable for war crimes, also understandable for Zelensky. What it tells you is neither party is in a position to really engage in a serious negotiation. The sad thing and the tragedy is this conflict is going to have to go on for at least another year. And somebody is going to have to get strategic advantage over the other <clears throat> before either side is going to start thinking about uh, some kind of peace arrangement. And I, I think, don't know, Linda, you may have a different... I think on the nuclear issue in particular, <clears throat> um, so we assess that right now this is more an intimidation tactic than uh, really a, a serious threat of, of using nuclear <clears throat> weapons. Of course, we don't discount it. It's too important to discount that. Um, but if you look at it as an intimidation tactic, I do think there are lessons uh, to be learned. If the international community um, caves to that kind of intimidation, uh, I do think that um, Putin will take a lesson, as will others uh, that are nuclear armed, um, about making threats um, and what the Western world will do. All right, well, if you don't mind, let's move to China. I want to make, I want to do one little vignette before. Okay. And it, uh, President Bush mentioned the fact that Linda was his briefer and he would push back. One of the things that's very interesting and what I was thought was very interesting was to watch the relationship between the president and the president's briefer. Because the president would push back and ask questions and push. And at one point, 
you could see the, on the expression on the briefs' faces, why are you giving me this hard time? And the president leaned forward and said, I want to know what you know, how you know it, and what is your level of conviction mm -hmm. in what you know? Mm. Because it tells me how much weight I should put on your view when I have to make hard policy decisions. Mm. So he said, I'm going to push you. I'm going to ask questions. But I'm not asking you to change your opinion. I don't want you to change mm -hmm. your opinion. But I need to know what you know, how you know it, and what is your level of conviction. And I think that's the right tempo and the relationship between a president and the I'm going to add on one tiny vignette. So when I took over the job as a, a briefer, um, I'm told that the only thing President Bush asked of my predecessor was, could she take the heat? Um, and by that, it, it was exactly as you were, you were saying. Um, I did get a test, though, apparently. I remember it was my second day. And we were down, and we were down at, the, at the ranch. And um, the president's personal aide walked in carrying a box. And he put the box down, and he mumbled something about it being toys for Barney. Um, but I was in the midst of prepping to do a briefing is like cramming for finals every morning. And I would start at about midnight, and I would be, be trying to anticipate the kinds of questions that I was going to get asked, and calling up our experts, and making sure I knew the answers. So I was like, whatever about the box. And um, after the briefing was over, the president asked me if I could get something out of the box. And I said, oh, you mean the one for Barney? And I went over, I said, sure. I went over, I opened the box, and it was rigged to have a snake jump out. <laughs> um, and, and I looked at it, and I said, I don't know if you remember this, sir. I looked at it, and I said, I think Barney got this one. And I closed the box. And afterwards, his, his aide came up to me and he said, what do you have, like ice in your veins? And I told him, no, I have an eight-year-old, and you're going to have to do better. <laughs> 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 so, that's fantastic. Yeah, so. it, it could have been worse. It could have been yeah. worse. That's right. The president's first briefer was Michael Morrell, a wonderful guy. And early on, Michael came down to the ranch to brief the president. And I was substituting for Condi, so I was sitting in as well. And Michael, you know, was dressed up fine. He had a brand new briefcase. And he opened the briefcase, took out his briefing book, closed his briefcase, put it on the floor, and started to brief the president. And Barney, the world's greatest dog, came over and started chewing on the corner <laughs> of this brand new briefcase. And you could see Mike sitting there looking at the dog and thinking, <clears throat> this is the president's dog. Can I kick him? <laughs> so I asked the president to call him back. We sat there the whole time, and Barney made quick work of the briefcase. <laughs> So I, I see a pattern here. I'm not going to go into what you said, but you're the chair of your National Economic Council on her, his first briefing. Uh, you, stumped, you stumped him, and he lost his whole train of thought, and it was over before it ever started. He got, got back the second day and got, got on it. But uh, um, as, as we move to, to China, you know, each year, the officer director of national intelligence uh, basically submits, they submit a report, or he submits a report, he, she submits a report to Congress detailing uh, what are the greatest threats to US national security over the next year. And um, I read those reports. If you don't read them, I suggest you Google them. Uh, and in the last probably four or five years in a row, we list China as the number one threat to US national security. Um, what is the intelligence community doing uh, to help policymakers and the administration truly understand kind of the enormity of the threat that China poses to us from a national security perspective? Um, I think you're absolutely right. We have been listing China um, now for the last several years as um, probably the largest um, strategic threat that we face. Um, and I think it's really important to kind of contrast that. We just spent so much time talking about Russia. You know, during the Cold War, what we were really, really looking at was an idealistic or an I a threat over ideology and militarily. But with China, it's a threat in so many domains. Um, whether it be in technology, whether it be diplomatically, whether it be space, cyberspace, whatever, they're just, you know, um, it, it is really something that is much more pervasive. Um, so that is one of the things that we have been, um, as a, an intelligence community, really focused on. We are at CIA, we are dedicating uh, many more resources. About a year ago, we created, it is our only single country focused, what we call a mission center, which is where our analysis and our operations um, are working together on China. So we have the China Mission Center, and that was Director Burns um, ordered that to happen. Um, so I think what we're doing is really trying to put out there just the breadth 
of the threat. Um, and then to talk through as well this idea, and some of these are traditional, you could talk Taiwan and it's more of a, a military kind of threat. Um, but what we've seen is that at this point, she has come out of the last party Congress, probably the strongest leader since Mao. Um, we're talking about you know, a, a country that approaches us at an, from a whole of government approach. Uh, we are trying to work with policymakers um, to help folks understand that in order to counter this, it's going to take a whole of policy approach from the US as well. And we can talk a little bit more about this, but also from the private sector. Mm. Um, you know, this is not something that, that the government can, can do alone. Um, and that's something that we've been trying to help educate um, folks on. You know, one of the interesting things about this book, uh, the transition memo on China and our East Asian relations, which is in the book, if you read it and you see that the China President Bush faced is so different from the China we face mm -hmm. today. Um, that China was a China that was <clears throat> wanted a benign international environment so we could focus on economic development, that really wanted to enter into the international system and cooperate with the United States. And we got an enormous amount of cooperation done with China during that period of time. Now, the president was smart about it because while we wanted to try to have a constructive relationship with China and bring China into the international system, we also hedged. And so at the president's direction, we strengthened our alliances in Asia with Japan, mm -hmm. South Korea, Australia. We opened a strategic relationship with India so that India would be a partner as we dealt with global challenges as both a way to put a framework which would encourage positive behavior by China but be a hedge and give us a platform to deal with China if we were unsuccessful in that effort. And I think two things come from that. One is Xi Jinping was an inflection point. He had a different agenda and took China over now 10 years in a very different direction. And the challenge for the intelligence community was to spot that change and then to help inform policymakers about how to respond to it. And I think the Trump administration gets some credit for having raised the warning about the, the new China. And the second thing I would say is that it's a good thing that we did the shoring up of our alliances. Absolutely. Uh, because it has been the foundation that the Biden administration, first Trump, and, but now especially the Biden administration, is using to deal with emerging China. So it's a very interesting retrospective on how, how far things have changed from what President <clears throat> Bush faced and what President Biden is now facing today. And uh, Linda, thank you. Linda, uh, you mentioned that the pri you need help from the private sector, or let's say the administration mm -hmm. needs help from the private sector. In, in our office, we joke and say if uh, national security was left up to the private sector, we'd all be speaking Chinese tomorrow. So when we have this gap between the <coughs> intelligence community, uh, who says China is a big threat, or the biggest threat from a kinetic perspective, from a cyber perspective, from a economic perspective and from a information slash data perspective, um, why does Wall Street, or how does Wall Street miss it? Uh, meaning, how, why is that gap so wide? Wall Street can't wait to invest another dollar in the next Chinese IPO, while the intelligence community tells us for years on end that they are the biggest risk to our way of life. How does, how does that gap continue to widen? So, so I'll just say, um, as I mentioned earlier at CIA, we set up a China Mission Center. The other new mission center we set up is um, one that is on transnational threat um, and technology. And it was set up really with this idea for, um, in part, for us to be able to both better engage with the private sector, um, but also for the private sector to, I'm told CIA is hard to get in touch with, right? So <laughs> to have a front door that someone would know where to knock on it if they wanted to talk to us about things. Um, so we have realized we need to up our game um, with the private sector. I will say again, from CIA's perspective, that's hard. Mm -hmm. It is hard for us to um, engage here in the US domestically without disadvantaging one company. One of the things I, I often talk about is like, you know, how do you brief Coke but not Pepsi? Or what do you do? How are we going to do this? Um, from my perspective, much like after 9-11, uh, where we had to rewire government is the way I put it in many ways, I do think we're gonna have to do that um, to engage the private sector better. I think government's gonna have to figure out how to, the intelligence community is gonna have to figure out how to do the domestic, for lack of a better phrase. Um, so I think that that would be, be part of it. We, we do need to up our game. 
Um, but I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It, it's an economic bottom line. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps one of the things we have to do is help the um, private sector understand that while you may be making a bigger profit today, long term, the possibility of an autocratic you know, Chinese government privatizing your data, demanding things of you as a company, all of those kinds of things longer term um, are maybe risks that you don't want to take. Mm. Uh, it's, you, know, you know, it's part of the problem when your biggest geopolitical rival is also one of your biggest economic partners. And even as we've talked about decoupling the two economies and separating particularly in high-tech high tech space, the volume of trade between the United States and China went up in 2022. Um, so it, it is a dilemma. And I think the other thing about it is the sectors of, of business uh, have to understand that the geopolitical environment is changing. And what sectors of our economy that were simply commercial are now part of our national security mm -hmm. architecture. And this has been a process that's going on for a long time. In the 80s and 90s, it was the telecommunications industry which needed to recognize they had some national security responsibilities that required them to cooperate with the government. Then the computer industry went through the same thing. Started here, don't speak the same language, gradually had to recognize they had some national security responsibilities. Social media has gone through that, and now the high-tech areas like AI are gonna have to go through it as well. There's gonna be no substitute for a conversation between those sectors, key sectors of the economy, mm -hmm. and the national security community. They've gotta start, they've gotta sit down together, they've gotta get a common language and a common approach. That's what it's gonna take. Well, I can appreciate that. I, I think it just looks to me like we're, we're creating, we're making the same mistakes over and over again. We, we and our allies lent to Germany uh, in the rebuild after World War I, and we built their war machine. We kept investing in Russia until it was too late, and here we are plowing hundreds of billions of dollars into building China's war machine and China's military industrial complex. I just, I find it, we need the, we need the IC to brief the administration and, and really push them harder uh, on this, and I know uh, Linda doesn't really want to talk about the balloon, but I, I'd assume everybody here uh, wants to talk about the balloon, so maybe we can talk about it uh, uh, in, in different ways that, that, that are okay with you. But sure. Uh, it, from a policy perspective, yeah. you know, this, this balloon, we just, we just had our Congress agree on something. We just had a 419 to zero vote. I mean, that's incredible. So is this a, is this a time which we should advance the intelligence community's knowledge on the, on the China threat because it's so topical and it's, it's across, call it, uh, uh, the average American's mind right now? Um, so I guess two things I would say. One, um, I am positive that she did not want to see um, that kind of unanimity in Congress. Um, for years, I think the, you know, uh, the PRC has been looking at this idea of can they um, calibrate their policies to take advantage of the you know, lack of bipartisanship. Um, and so I agree with you. I think this could be a, a bit of a watershed moment from Xi's perspective. Um, going back to the, a little bit about what you said about you know, the intelligence community needs to push. Um, I do think it's really important to, to make sure folks understand that from the intelligence community's perspective, our job is not to advocate. Our job is to inform. Um, and so, you know, whether it's that uh, we're going, we will, in, we will inform out the wazoo, right? We will try and tell you as much as we think you need to know about what's happening today and what's happening, you know, five years from now, 10 years from now. I, I often call it, you know, trying to get policymakers to eat their vegetables, right? It's this idea of, there's something that you know, is going to happen 10 years from now when you're no longer in office, but if you don't do something today, this, this might happen. Um, and that's really hard because their plates are filled with the agenda of today, right? Um, and so, but we don't push from a standpoint of advocating. We just, we inform and, and tell them um, things that, you know, over to them to make the policy decisions on it, um, on the balloon. Um, so. I, I guess what I would say about the balloon as well. Um, so this is something that we're, we're still analyzing. It's really important as well as, as analysts for us not to come to judgment too early. 
Um, so there's a lot still that folks are looking at, trying to understand um, origins, not just of the first balloon, but of these latest shoot downs. Um, you know, our understanding of um, you know, China's efforts to surveil the US. Look, it's not just balloons that they're using. They'd be using satellites, all kinds of other things. Um, so looking at the advantage of why they might want something with a longer dwell time or why they might want um, to have uh, a different platforms. Sure, we, we, we're looking at, at all of those kinds of things. You know, it's interesting. I'll chide my friend Linda just a little bit. The intelligence community delivers to the White House an enormous amount of stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, reports on everything, you know, you can imagine. And I sometimes thought that the reason the intelligence community did so is they knew I didn't possibly have enough day, hours of the day to read all that stuff. But it would allow to say that, that if something happened, they had told us about it. <clears throat> I think the intelligence community does bring information. I think what the intelligence community can do and what the DNI and the DCI need to do and the CIA director need to do for the president is to help on priority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at some point say, you know, Mr. President, this is something you are going to, that is really going to be taking over your time in the next six months. And our judgment is, in terms of priorities, this is at the top of the list. I think that kind of thing to help the president figure out how to spend his time is really important. The balloon thing is interesting. Um, I particularly like the report that, and I don't know how they did it, whether it was the F-22 that was buzzing around the balloon, but apparently someone has figured out that they're made in America parts on the Chinese balloon that we just <laughs> shot down. Now that's going to be a, the, the Congress is going to have a lot of fun with that in, in terms of export controls and the like. But one of the questions I think is how do you, re, as a policymaker, how do you respond to that? And you know, one way to respond is, you know, everybody's air is on power, everybody's talking about it. Um, and, and I think one of the things I would say is I think we've gotten in the habit of talking too much and doing too little and substituting statements of what is unacceptable to the United States from actually doing things that will deter our adversaries. And I don't think you'd mind my saying, Bob Gates had a different approach to dealing with the balloon. His view was we should, shoot it, we should have shot it down when it was over the Aleutian Islands, not said a word about it publicly. The Chinese would have known very well what we had done. And go ahead and be, send Anthony Blinken, our Secretary of State, to Beijing and let Beijing have the burden of canceling the visit if that's what they wanted to do. I think there's something in that. People say we looked weak because we let the balloon go across the United States and only took it down once it got off the coast of South Carolina. You know, if you're a great power, you also look weak if you protest too much things that may not really have a lot of national security significance. And I think that's the kind of thing from a policy perspective you need to sort through uh, when you deal with the issue of, of, uh, of how to deal with something like that. I think we need sometimes a little more subtlety and shrewdness and strategy in our policy responses. And that's not in the policy people, that's not in the intelligence community. Mm -hmm. Linda, you mentioned the, the 20th Party Congress and she's increasingly bellicose rhetoric about um, the kind of forceful reunification mm -hmm. of Taiwan. And we've seen she um, make speeches similar to the ones that Putin made pre-invasion. Uh, is, is, is what she said and did in the 20th Party Congress, does it, does it uh, alarm you? Or does it raise the level of alarm in your mind? So uh, we know uh, through intelligence that she has told his military that they need to be ready um, to, um, for an invasion of Taiwan by 2027. That doesn't mean that we think he's made that decision to do so, mm. um, but to make sure that the military is ready to do so. That also doesn't mean that he couldn't go earlier, right? It's that's just a, a target date that, that he has set. Um, I do think that he has taken some lessons out of uh, what's happened in uh, Ukraine. Um, one of those being that if you're going to go in, you better go in with overwhelming force. Um, I think he's also taken a lesson of, you know, you're going to need to do more probably on the cyber front, other kinds of things. So I do think he's still continuing to get his uh, military ready and the the further we move into this decade, 
the more concerned I, I am um, uh, about this. Um, so, so yes, I, I think that we're, we, we certainly have raised that, that alarm. I think one of the things we forget about is that she has a lot of options mm -hmm. for pressuring Taiwan. And uh, one of the things you need to do, the policy community working with the intelligence community is to map what are all the options, what are the, all the ways that Xi Jinping can put pressure on Taiwan to try to bring it to its knees, to make some kind of accommodation. And there are a lot of them. And one of them we saw on display after N uh, Speaker Pelosi went to Taiwan. They selectively closed airspace and water space so there could be Chinese exercises in these areas. And you can see very shrewdly, they could continue to do that, sort of wave after waves of exercise, closing and opening airspace, uh, shipping lanes and the like, making Taiwan an unreliable s supplier in terms of the global supply chains, uh, raising the level of tensions. Uh, they could uh, do some things, for example, to take a couple Taiwan-controlled islands that are actually right off the coast of China, just to show that they mean it when they say Taiwan is part of sovereign China. Uh, they could crack down on Taiwanese businesses, doing enormous amount of business in the mainland. They could put some pressure on them. She has lots of devices and tools for pressuring Taiwan. And while we're all focused on the big option of going in and invade, which we should be, we need, I worry that we're not spending enough time in a conversation with the intelligence community and the policy community saying, what are the array of things she can do and what are our counters, either to deter or protect against them? That's the kind of exercise I think we need. I agree. Um, when we look at, if we analyze what they've done in, in the Taiwan Strait, what China's done, call it back to 2014, they used to run a, to use a football analogy, they used to run a zone defense when we started tra transiting the Strait. 2014, they went to a, more of a, a man defense. Uh, post Pelosi's visit, they're now full court press, and we have McCarthy going now um, since Blinken yep. canceled his trip. So the ratchet only goes one way. Where does it go next? Do they do they just blockade the strait, and do they do do they exercise this kind of enormous power they have to just cut Taiwan off from energy that they import every single day. This is where the risk really comes in. I mean, China made a statement a couple months ago, and Linda should correct me, that they declared the Taiwan Straits were no longer international waters. Mm -hmm. They were actually sovereign China waters. Now, we've made rightly the statement that we're going to continue to treat them as international waters. We're going to fly there, we're going to sail there, and all the rest, and we're going to try to get our friends and allies to do the same thing. That's the right response, but you see the risk. Mm. Because if the Chinese decide to enforce that interpretation and try to interdict our aircraft and our ships, um, that becomes a real problem and could be a flashpoint. You remember the Bush administration started out with a crisis in China as a hot-dogging uh, China uh, fighter pilot forced down a US intelligence aircraft and took the plane and a crew hostage for five to 10, 12 days before we could get him out. So one of the risks here is of an inadvertent collision between American and Chinese air forces and Chinese forces, uh, naval forces, that provokes a crisis that neither country actually wants, but neither country can figure out how to avoid. And that's why people talk so much from a policy standpoint, we need to try to put communication channels and crisis management channels in place. During the EP3 incident that I was talking about, President Bush couldn't get a hold of Jiang Zemin because he was traveling in Africa. And it was days before we could even get him on the phone. Mm -hmm. So this is, there, this is a risky situation at this point, and it needs to be addressed. And that's why at some point, Secretary of State Blinken needs to go sit down in Beijing and say, look, how are we going to manage this situation? Or we're going to both be in a situation where uh, let's, let's recognize that a war over Taiwan is lose-lose for everybody, Taiwan, United States, and China. Yeah. So does, in this day and age, does General Milley have a counterpart in the, in the PLA that, that uh, will answer the phone? Do, that, do we have that kind of communication, or, or do we handle that? We know that uh, the Chinese side. declined our Secretary of Defense's call right. in the wake of the balloon gate. Not a good sign. 
So uh, back to that 2022 report, we'll switch gears. Uh, in, the, in the DNI 22, 2022 assessment, I, find it, I found it um, interesting that, that it lists uh, Al Qaeda uh, and ISIS yet again as looking to exploit any kind of uh, uh, governance issues uh, globally to continue to inflict potential uh, uh, attacks on, on US soil. Uh, how big of a threat are they? Are they still a threat? Are they still a, a domestic terror threat for us? Uh, where do they fit in this whole puzzle of, of what really, uh, what risks we're facing in the next year? So I, I guess since then I know we're running um, kind of out, almost out of time, I would say that you know when I talk about the threats that are facing um, us today, we already talked about Russia, we talked about China, we talked a little bit about technology. Terrorism is certainly um, still there. Um, and it's a threat that um, we remain concerned about. We can't keep our, take our eye off the ball and we don't intend to. Um, but I do think we're gonna have to do things differently. Uh, again, you know, as threats proliferate in so many different areas, um, the intelligence community is only so large and has to, to kind of make some shifts. Um, again, this idea that we can rely more on some of the partners that we have uh, built up their expertise um, and their capabilities around the world, uh, that's great. Uh, and I think that we'll be absolutely um, continuing to focus on it. I, I think the, you know, the, the takedown last year of um, uh, Zawahiri shows that we are not taking our, our eye off the ball. Um, and so again, but it, it's something that, that's out there is still a threat. Thank you. All right, we're, we're here, a couple of minutes left, and I know President Bush loves us to finish a bit early, so we're gonna stay on this here. <laughs> uh, I wanna say a big thanks to, to Steve Hadley and Linda Weisskull for being here tonight. Um, also wanna thank uh, Next Point, Jim Dondero, uh, who I used to live with back in 1995, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, for endowing the Engage at Bush Center series. <laughs> Uh, next up in the series is a program launching the new special exhibit, Freedom Matters. Business leader and philanthropist David Rubenstein uh, will discuss the significant historical artifacts featured in the exhibit, including the Declaration of Independence, U.S. Constitution, Bill of Rights, and the Federalist Papers. There's a copy of the Magna Carta from 1302, a rare version of the Emancipation Proclamation, and much more. Uh, go to thebushcenter.org to register. Uh, and don't forget on your way out tonight to stop by the museum store. Steve Hadley will be there signing copies of his new book, Handoff, about President Bush's foreign policy transition process. Thank you for coming and uh, good night. One minute. Thank you.